Welcome to Corporate Governance at LSE. My name is Tom Kirchmeier and I have with me Jeffrey Owen, a colleague of mine here at LSE who has written a book on biotechnology. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. So the big question is, how is biotechnology in Britain? Well, this technique or set of techniques known as biotechnology came to the fore in the 70s and 80s. And at that time, British science was sort of on a par with American science. And, and we had uh, lots of experts in, in the molecular biology and so on. And so as these uh, techniques were converted into businesses, into firms, it seemed in the early days that we would be, we the British would be, a, if not matching the Americans, at least be able to, d to develop strong international leaders in the new industry of biotechnology. And it's turned out to be rather disappointing in the sense that although the science is excellent, world class, we've produced very few world class companies. Why is that? Well, that's what the book is really about, and, and, and it's not a sort of single explanation. Um, some people say that uh, part of the problem is, is short-termism in the City of London, that f investors, financial institutions aren't patient enough with science-based firms whose research will only pay off in the, in the long term. Uh, and so short-termism is sometimes seen as the culprit. But then if you look at the US, uh, which is overwhelmingly the most successful nation in biotech, um, it is also often criticized for short-termism. So uh, it doesn't seem as though um, short-termism as such or, or flaws in the financial system are uh, at the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a mixture of factors. Uh, one important thing is that when the American firms got started, there were several of them, such as Genentech and Amgen and, and um, Biotech, which were early successes, early successes, mm -hmm. which made investors a lot of money. And so investors began to take a keen interest in this new biotech uh, sector and prepared to support other firms who were coming, coming on after in the 80s and 90s. And it kind of fed on itself. You know, there was, a, there was a sort of momentum of growth. Whereas we had a number of firms that got started mostly in the 80s and 90s, and there were very few big successes. And then at the end of the 90s, there were a number of setbacks. Some firms that looked promising uh, failed, and um, and investors got disillusioned mm. and, and lost interest. So from the early 2000s onwards, although it's changed a bit in the last couple of years, there was less money available either from venture capitalists or from um, public market investors uh, on the stock market. So there was a sort of element, I wouldn't say of chance, but, but uh, the Americans hit the high spots very mm. early and we didn't. The big question is, can we learn something from that, that it didn't take off? In well, I think, of course, this financial uh, system that the, American has, that the Americans have, very strong venture capital, very strong stock market, NASDAQ in particular, well organized to support um, uh, science-based high growth firms like Microsoft and so on. That's been one factor, but I think there are other important factors. The US federal government, uh, plows a huge amount of money into biomedical research. And so you've got all these universities like MIT on the East Coast and Stanford and others on the West Coast, which have, are well-funded and conduct uh, uh, world-leading research in, in molecular biology, genetics, and so on. And in America, you've got a stream of, of um, uh, professors and students who break away from their university to start new firms. And, and it's a kind of um, almost a sort of self-reinforcing process. But know? what you're saying is we have a problem with our universities here. Either they're not well enough funded or the spin-out process doesn't I, work I, I think the spin-out process ha has, um, compared to other parts of Europe, the UK is, is not in a bad state. And, and you have Cambridge and Oxford and Imperial in London, UCL and so on, which have generated um, quite a few spin-off firms. Um, and obviously they're not as, these clusters are not as big as Boston or, or, or San Francisco. Um, but it's, um, by European standards, it's, it's quite good. But what so often happens is that these spin-off firms don't grow to the 
medium-sized or large firms, and, and that's been a, a problem which governments have been wrestling with. You know, we have two big pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. in this country, GlaxoSmithKline and um, AstraZeneca, but then there's a big gap and not many um, uh, medium-sized mm -hmm. pharma biotech firms, and that's what's missing. The in pipeline the is quite empty the in a way. The pipeline is, is, is poor. Yeah. But then still, it, it points in a way to a failure of the financial system. No, if we can't get the spin-outs to a size so they can compete on a global base, no? Well, is it, uh, the question is whether the financial institutions, investors, are taking a rational view of the prospects for, for British firms. And the, a very important difference between the two countries, US and the UK, is that the investment community that is committed to biotech is very, very much bigger in the US than UK. Mm -hmm. And there are more investors who know about this, uh, the industry, there are more analysts, more scientists who advise them and so on. And so there's a more receptive um, uh, financial market, a more, more receptive set of investors over there, which is why some of the best of the, the British firms have um, moved to, to, across to the US yeah. to get listed on NASDAQ rather than um, on the London Stock Exchange or, or on AIM and, and where, where, they've, where their science is more, um, more understood and more likely to win support. So we're lacking critical size. I think scale is an yeah. absolutely critical factor, yeah. and which is one of the reasons why Europe is, is important in this, con in this context, because in principle, at any re uh, uh, an integrated European market ought to be able to offer similar scale advantages that the Americans enjoy. And, and, um, and some progress has been made in that direction, but the Europe, in this pharma biotech sector, Europe, European Union is still quite... Um, fragmented uh, by national barriers. Because the education system is too national? So well, therefore... I think it's more to do with um, each country has its own health care system and they have their own uh, pricing and reimbursement system for, for drugs, different. France is different from the UK, different from Germany and so on. So when you're launching a drug, a new drug in Europe, you have to go through all these different national regulatory um, processes. Whereas in the US, if you can get through the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, you can launch immediately. And another factor worth mentioning is the difference between the UK and the US, which applies to pharma as a whole, not just to, to biotech, is that in the US, up to now at any rate, there are no price controls. So uh, companies are relatively free, of course there's pressure to reduce prices, but are relatively free to price their novel drugs um, at, at a high level. And that, that, I think, has been an extra incentive for entrepreneurs and firms to invest in high-risk research. Mm, to take on the risk. Yeah. Because yes. they have That's right. high rewards, potentially. Exactly. Hi high risk, high rewards, yeah. So are you suggesting we should stop these price controls <laughs> for that I, type I, of I drugs? I think it's um, very unlikely that, uh, given the constraints on government spending and all the rest of it, that, that uh, countries like the UK are going to suddenly uh, liberalise pricing. Uh, but but um, I think um, uh, th th there are issues as to whether the regulatory system that we have in the UK, for example, is, um, is uh, too restrictive in terms of novel drugs and, and, uh, and some uh, what look like promising treatments for cancer and whatever are, are, are not accepted in the National Health Service because the price is too high. Um, but I, I think probably um, there's a limit to what can be achieved for political reasons on, on that front. And of course in America there's a lot of um, uh, anger, um, not least in the presidential campaign, election campaign, about the high price that pharmaceutical companies charge for, for drugs. And so there could be changes in the US which would make a difference to that market. So what's the way forward? <laughs> well, I think the way forward, we've, we've just got to peg, peg away at it. And, mm. and in the last couple of years, some of the good science, high quality science that, that we have in this country seems to be bearing fruit. And, and it's interesting that in, in, in uh, 2014 and 15 and a little bit now, quite a lot of American investment is coming into the UK, um, venture capital and other forms of investment, 
um, uh, I into promising British firms. So, so I think there is an opportunity for, for, for Britain, um, and it, it, you know, the, the quality of the science and experienced managers too um, is attracting fresh investment from outside. Let's hope your words come true. Uh, thanks. thanks for coming in. Okay, thank you. And many thanks for watching. <laughs>